our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the glory to you, O Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, praise be to thee, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's good to be at St. Agnes Church this morning. Good for us to be gathered for the worship of Almighty God on this beautiful day. Good for us to be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead. And good for us to have this opportunity to connect as bishop and congregation on the occasion of the bishop's annual visit. I'm grateful to you all for your <coughs> hospitality this morning, uh, extended to me and my wife Caroline, who's here today. Uh, we're grateful for that hospitality, but really we are grateful to you at St. Agnes for your leadership in our diocese. Here in this part of our diocese that is so important to not only the history of our diocese, but also for its present day and its future. So I'm grateful to you all for your leadership as a congregation as a whole. I'm grateful to Linda for her leadership here. Uh, so very grateful not only for her leadership, but also for her care of you and your care for her. So I'm grateful for that. And grateful as well to your mission council for its not only leadership in these times that have been so stressful in the life of our society and of our church over the last uh, few years. Grateful to them for that leadership, but also to the Mission Council for its good stewardship of the resources that have been given you all here at St. Agnes Church for the mission and ministry of the church here in this part of our diocese. So grateful for that. And grateful as well for all the folk who are involved in the ministry of this congregation. You all are probably very aware uh, of how many people it takes to resource the ministry of a congregation like St. Agnes. Pretty much, I'd say, looking around, everybody in the congregation. Uh, it really does take everybody working together in order to resource those ministries and help them flourish. But I'm especially grateful to everybody who's here for their leadership in our diocese. Whatever your circumstances are, you might be a longtime member, you might be someone who has arrived here today for the first time. God said to you this morning, it's time for you to go check out that church around the corner. Uh, you could be here for the first time today. Uh, but whatever your circumstances are, long-time member, first time, 
you're all leaders in the Diocese of Tennessee and here at St. Agnes Church because you all are the ones who have turned out and shown up here today and are making it possible for us to be the church here at this time in this place. You all are doing that. I'm, I'm not doing that. You all are doing that. By your prayers and presence, you're making that possible. Uh, God is at work in you. Uh, God is at work in you, uh, bringing you together here at St. Agnes Church so that we can be the church. And I am incredibly grateful to you all for that wonderful gift of leadership that is so fundamental of just simply turning out and showing up. It is truly good for us to be together here at St. Agnes Church this morning. Park. <laughs> no trip to St. Agnes is complete without <coughs> the train whistle. From our gospel this morning, he pro prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus' encounter with the ten lepers, which we've heard this morning, is recounted only, only by St. Luke the Evangelist. Of course, stories of healing abound in the four Gospels. Nothing new here. These are powerful signs that Jesus is the Messiah and has come to save his people. Saving and healing are virtually the same word in the Gospels. They're words with a common root, reminding us that every miracle of healing is tied up with a broader vision of human salvation. There's a meaning in these miracles of healing, and it speaks of our own salvation. As Jesus heals the sick in our Gospel accounts, we see in our midst the Savior of the world. The healing of lepers, in particular, is well attested in the Gospel tradition. Those who suffered from this disease were separated from the community in a unique way. Under the law of the Old Covenant, lepers were ritually unclean and not allowed to live in the Jewish community. This prescription is probably rooted in the contagious nature of some forms of this disease, but the ritual proscription of direct contact separated lepers from the worship and community life of the people of God. It's bad enough to be ill. Even worse, as some discovered in the pandemic, to be quarantined and separated from family and friends. That's the situation of the leper in ancient Israel. Even more, lepers living on the margins of community were required by the law to give notice of their presence by shouting and warning people who might get close. Imagine that. I'm sure, again, it's inspired by practical considerations, but nevertheless, humiliating. Notice how the lepers in our reading are keeping their distance from Jesus. There's no doubt that lepers occupied a humble place in the biblical world, separated from community and humiliated by having to draw notice and attention to themselves so that no one would come near them. Now having said this about leprosy, the most distinctive thing about Luke's account of this healing is the presence of a Samaritan among the ten who are cleansed. One of them is a Samaritan as the Gospel of Luke tells us. Remember, Samaritans, this group, were the Jews' neighbors, pretty close neighbors, not only geographically, but also religiously. They were people who observed some elements of the law. 
But they did not worship in Jerusalem, in the temple. They had their own places of worship. And they did not acknowledge the Jewish prophets. Now, pious Jews <coughs> in Jerusalem considered them, the Samaritans, to be foreigners. As it says in our reading, foreigners. People who were not just different, and this is an interesting point, but actually people who had been brought in to replace the Jews of the Northern Kingdom who had been deported to Assyria. That's how the story went. And this terrible replacement libel, like all others of its kind, made every Samaritan, every Samaritan, the enemy of every Jew. What a horrible situation. These people living so close to each other, and yet terrible enemies. People came to think that what was different was something to be abhorred. And what happened was that enmity was sown, and division became rife between peoples. Closest neighbors together, divided by this fundamental conflict. Yet in Jesus' healing of the ten lepers, it's the Samaritan who returns to give thanks. Kind of the point of the story. Ten are healed, but one comes and gives thanks. And that person is the Samaritan. Jesus' own words underscore the significance of the action. Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? There it is. Jesus is calling everyone's attention to the really extraordinary thing that's happened. It's the one who was most despised in the eyes of the people of God, the enemy, those people who live right over there, they're so much like us, but boy, they are our enemies, every single one of them. It's that person who turns out to be the one who acknowledges the gift of healing, the one who returns and give, gives thanks to God. Now, this is not a, a one-off occasion in Jesus' ministry, something that just, you know, it happened this way, doesn't mean much. It's not a one-off occasion because Jesus himself, earlier in Luke's Gospel, tells the story, a story about the Good Samaritan, the one who turns out to be the neighbor of the man who has been beaten and left for dead on the road to Jericho, the road to Jerusalem. After a priest and a Levite have each passed by the stricken man in Jesus' story, a Samaritan takes the man to safety and provides for his care. So in that story that Jesus tells, it's not the pious, the pious ones who turn out to be the good guys in the story but rather the one who is the enemy of the people. And then in John's Gospel, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well is another instance of Jesus' own ministry extended to a Samaritan, including, through his action, including the despised foreigner among those who are called to repentance, and salvation. The universal call of God to all peoples and nations is a part of the lesson we're meant to take away from this story of miraculous healing. Ten lepers are cleansed. One returns to give thanks. He is a Samaritan. There's a significance in the miracle. As St. Paul puts it, in the letter to the Ephesians. Christ has broken down the dividing wall 
that is the hostility between us. This hostility between Jew and Samaritan had become a burden that oppressed both peoples. Being locked in this hostility, every Samaritan an enemy, every Jew an enemy. What a terrible thing. But Christ has broken down that dividing wall, Paul says. He's broken down the hostility that exists between us. Christ has come to bring us together, not just Jew and Samaritan or Jew and Gentile, but Christ has come to bring us together, to unburden us of this hostility that exists between peoples. But I think more than this, we're meant to see in the despised stranger a person who models for us what it means to be a humble recipient of God's blessing. You can look to this despised Samaritan to find the pattern for how we are to be in Christ. It's the Samaritan who comes and gives thanks. That's our pattern. We can learn from the stranger in our midst what it is to be truly thankful, to receive a gift and return thanks for it. So fundamental to who we are in Christ, that thanksgiving for the gift that God gives us. So our confirmants today are receiving a gift. Of course, that gift is the grace of God through prayer and the laying on of hands. We're gathered here in prayer today, those who have turned out and shown up. We're gathered here in prayer. God's grace is His power and presence in our lives that we need <coughs> in order to follow through as disciples. God giving us grace through prayer and the laying on of hands today. And all of us gathered here today, surrounding <coughs> our confirmants, have the opportunity to reaffirm our own baptismal vows and to recommit ourselves to following Christ, to follow in that model that we're given today in the story of miraculous healing. We come to the altar this morning to give thanks to God for all he has done, all he has done for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. We're like the one in our gospel who returns to give thanks, mindful of the gift of God. May we who have received the gift reach out in love and concern to the strangers who are our neighbors, whoever they may be. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, let us ascribe as his most justly due all might, power, <coughs> majesty, and dominion this day and forever. Amen. Amen.